to talk to you about learning how to receive. Just receive from God. Because you see, I think that we're always trying to get something. And get means to obtain by struggle and effort. But receive has a totally different meaning. It means to act as a receptacle and to simply take in what's being offered. And I can tell you God is offering much more than we're usually willing to receive or know how to receive, mainly because we don't think we deserve it or we feel that we need to earn it. You notice when the gentleman gave the testimony tonight and he talked about when his pastor laid his hand on him and he began to have that wonderful experience of the infilling of the Holy Spirit and he said, oh, I don't deserve this, I don't deserve this. And the pastor said, no, you don't, but just receive it. I thought it was kind of interesting that he shared his testimony in that way because that's exactly what I want to share with you tonight. You see, I don't believe that we're supposed to struggle all the time as Christians, do you? I don't think Jesus died so we could just now have a new brand of misery with a Christian label on it. I think that he came that we might have and enjoy our lives and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. And I'm teaching this weekend on enjoying life because I firmly believe what John 10, 10 says, that the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came that you might have and enjoy your life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. And as I said in one of these messages, even if you didn't want to be happy, you should be happy on purpose just because Jesus died and paid a price. We're the light of the world and we need to turn the bulbs on and let the world know out there that we're happy. And that doesn't mean you have to go around being giddy and silly all the time. But one of the things that, I, one of the definitions I like about the word joy is a calm delight. I think we can all just have a nice calm delight. Luke 18, 17. Truly I say to you, whoever does not accept and receive and welcome the kingdom of God like a little child does not, shall not, in any way enter it at all. For example, God wants us to receive forgiveness. And when you receive forgiveness, if you truly receive forgiveness, you know the Word of God, then there should never be any more guilt and condemnation after that. Okay, I'll sit down. When I sit here, that means I'm willing to wait till you get it. How much time do you waste feeling guilty about stuff that you've already repented for 12 times and asked God to forgive you? You waste days and days and days and years and sometimes a whole life. Forgiveness means that the sin has been wiped away, removed, not swept under a rug so God can pull it out sometime and aggravate us with it later on. He doesn't cover up our sins. He removes them, completely cleanses them, and washes them away. I want to teach you to do something in your prayer time. Instead of just saying, oh, God, forgive me, God. Oh, God, forgive me, God. Please forgive me, God. Oh, God, oh, God, forgive me. God, forgive me, forgive me. Oh, God, forgive me. And then going away and feeling guilty for a week. I know I live like that. I live like that. And I, I can tell you that I didn't feel right if I didn't feel wrong. And I went to church all the time. I was even teaching a home Bible study. I loved God. But I had an addiction to guilt. I think part of my problem got started in my childhood when my dad was sexually abusing me and I felt somehow or another like it was my fault, like there must be something wrong with me that he's wanting to do this to me. And I took on a spirit of shame which led to guilt. But I don't think you have to be abused to be like that. I, you know, we have to understand that Satan, one of his names is the accuser of the brethren. And he accuses you, and he accuses me all the time until you really learn who you are in Christ. And you begin to say, no, I'm not receiving that anymore. 
I want to share something with you tonight. Most of us are experts at receiving from the devil. And yet we don't know how to receive from God. So what you need to do from now on, you say, God, I know that what I did was wrong and I am so sorry. And based on your word of 1 John 1, 9, I repent of my sins and I believe according to your word, God, that you cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Now, God, I ask you to forgive me and here's what you need to do now. And I receive your forgiveness right now. And just take a moment and do that. I'm not trying to be, you know, supernatural spooky. But just take a moment and say, I receive that. Learn how to receive mercy. Mercy means that God will bless you when you don't deserve it. And he won't punish you when you do deserve it. It means that he'll help you when you haven't been especially good. I remember when our son was about 10 years old, and he's now the CEO of our stateside ministries and over all the media and the television and just does a wonderful job. He's running around here somewhere working, doing something. And uh, when he was about 10 years old, he wasn't a very disciplined guy, and we were always trying to get him to do his chores. And so we had a list that we tacked up on his door. And if he did those chores, he got little check marks, and when he got enough check marks, he got stars, and when he got enough stars, he got a gift. Well, that's a good way for parents to try to motivate their kids, but God doesn't use methods like that. We don't get stars and check marks for reading our Bible and praying and doing the things that we ought to do, and then when we get enough good work stored up, we get a gift. That's not the way God works. But I can remember, and God had to use this example to teach me a lesson about receiving mercy from Him, because the Bible says in Matthew 12, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. God wants us to give people mercy, not require a sacrifice out of them for them to make up for what they did wrong. And he wants us to learn how to receive mercy and not try to give him sacrifices for what we did wrong. And so in trying to teach me that, because I didn't, you know, I didn't grow up around mercy. I didn't get any mercy at home. I didn't know what mercy was. All I knew was work hard, earn, deserve, and maybe if you're good enough, you might get a little something. And I wasn't hearing the word taught as clearly as I'm trying to teach it to you tonight. I heard good word. I had good doctrinal principles. But I think many times we need the parable type messages like Jesus told so we can bring this thing into a practical level where people can really understand it and get it. Why do you think Jesus told stories? I don't have to use parables. I've still got enough of my own life. I don't even have to go anywhere else. Between me and Dave, we got it all covered. And so God used a story from my own life to show me what he meant. So there was, a, there was a bully in our neighborhood that would take Danny's ball away from him and throw it down the sewer. And Danny would come screaming in the house, Daddy! And this happened a few times. And of course, every time he did, Dave would run out, get the bully, chase the bully, get the ball, comfort his son, take care of him, meet his needs. So, this is the way God taught me about mercy. He said, now, Danny's got his list of things he's supposed to do on the door. And, you know, sometimes he does them better than others. But most of the time, to be honest, he wasn't real great at it. And he said, but what kind of a parent would you be if you heard Dan come screaming in from outside, Daddy, Daddy? What kind of a parent would you be if, say, you and Dave were sitting there talking and Say Dave stood up and said, Joyce, I hear our son screaming for help. He must be in trouble. Would you run downstairs, please, and check his list? See if he's done everything that he needs to do. And if he has enough check marks, then I'll help him. And if not, no parent that has any love for their child is going to do that. And that's exactly why the Bible says in Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, we have a high priest who understands 
our weaknesses and our infirmities because he's been tempted in every point just like we have yet he never sinned therefore let us come boldly to the throne of his grace that we might receive the help that we need in plenty of time to take care of the situation you're God's child and if you've got a heart that's right toward him even though you don't do everything perfect when you need help God will help you and you need to learn how to say God I need mercy give me mercy I know that I'm not a perfect specimen but I need help right now give me mercy but you see a lot of people won't even ask because they automatically assume that they don't have enough check marks on their calendar come on Come on, some of you, this is going to be a real night of breakthrough and freedom for you. Don't you miss a thing that I'm trying to say to you. God wants to give us grace. Grace, grace, and more grace. We hear the word grace thrown around so much that we barely even know what it means. Let me tell you what I believe grace is. This is kind of my definition after all these years of study. Grace, yes, is undeserved favor. It's a free gift from God. But I've also found scripture in the Amplified Bible, which I particularly am fond of, where it amplifies it out in James 4, 6, it says that grace is the power of the Holy Spirit to help us overcome all of our evil tendencies. Well, for years I struggled trying to change myself until I found out that I couldn't change myself because God was never going to take any of my works it had to come as a gift from him, and he wanted me, instead of trying to do it myself, to humble myself and say, I can't do it. And to even say, and I am bold enough to believe, God, that even while I'm still in this imperfect state, that you love me completely and unconditionally. And I receive your love. I may not be where I need to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. I'm okay, and I'm on my way. I'm making the journey. Why in the world should you sit in this building tonight condemned about anything? At least you have come here to try to get help. Don't you think that there's a smile on God's face tonight to see this auditorium full of people on a Friday night who love Him? We need to receive the love of God. The one thing that people need more than anything in this whole world, the one thing everybody's looking for is unconditional love. You just want somebody to love you just the way you are. <laughs> just don't tell me that I got to change three things for you to love me, that I got to lose 10 pounds for you to love me. Just love me. And maybe if you love me enough, then I'll want to change for you because you love me not to get you to love me. <laughs> we get so tired of these silent messages that we're not what people expect us to be. And if we don't change and do it quick, then we're out of the group. Well, see, the holy group that we deal with, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, they're not like that. They're not like that. I've got my own small group. Every day I get together with my small group, Joyce, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The thing that I want you to hear from me tonight is even as you have received Christ Jesus, so now you need to walk and live your life. Colossians 2, 6. How did we receive him? <laughs> God, I am such a mess. <laughs> if you, I mean, you didn't come and offer anything. You're just like, help me. But then it seems for some strange reason that as soon as we receive Christ, then we think we have all this now work that we're supposed to do 
And our work is to believe. We're believers and we're to believe. That doesn't mean that we don't do anything to cooperate with God. But the first thing you have to do before you start trying to do anything really is fall in love with Jesus. Let's look at Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For it is by free grace. Now I'm going to tell you what grace is. I believe that grace is the power of the Holy Spirit coming to us freely as a gift, enabling us to receive Christ through faith, but also enabling us to do whatever we need to do in life with ease, what we could never do with any amount of struggle and effort on our own. Now, I know that's long. I'll say it again. Grace is the power of the Holy Spirit. You have a project that's way beyond your head. God, I need grace. This is way over my head. I, I mean, I've been over my head for so long, it don't matter how much deeper I go. It's kind of good when you get in over your head because then it don't matter. You can just go for it. I mean, if God didn't keep us going, we wouldn't last one month. I mean, you talk about, if I thought about it very much, I would just fall out in a dead heap. I told Dave, sitting up here tonight, just looking at those testimonies again and hearing what that gentleman said and reading you these testimonies, I turned to Dave and I said, isn't it absolutely, phenomenally amazing what God is letting us do? And then I said to him, and Dave and I talk about this all the time, I don't even know how to think about it. God is so amazing that we don't even really know how to think about it. That he would send his only son to die for a bunch of people who didn't even care. We're living in sin and enjoying every moment of it. And he gave his best gift, his only son, to pay the price for our sins, to suffer in our place, to shed his blood, to pour his blood out so we could be completely cleansed and washed in that perfect blood. So all the death that we had could be covered up by the life that's in that blood. And he did that all before any one of us ever even cared. And the Bible says in Romans, if he freely gave us his son, will he not surely much more freely give us all other things? He'll give you the help you need. He'll give you mercy when you need it. He'll help you change. He'll help you go through any situation you need to go through with a smile on your face. He'll take care of you. He won't let you down. He will support you. But you have to learn how to receive. Now, it's very important that you learn how to receive because, listen, this, now this is, a, this is, you don't want to miss this. You cannot give away to somebody else what you don't have. So, I couldn't figure out why I was so hard-hearted. I mean, I was like an army drill sergeant with my kids. Get that trash out. Come on, right now. Get it, get it. Take it, take it. Out, 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 out. <laughs> and I didn't want to be like that. God, why am I so hard-hearted? Well, I had a hard heart because I'd been mistreated a lot in my life. And that became a way of protecting myself. And I got into a mode of wanting to boss everybody else around because that was the way I thought I was going to stay safe. But I didn't want to be like that anymore. I wanted to change, but I was having a hard time changing, and I would get aggravated at myself because I couldn't change. And then one day, God just simply said to me, you cannot give mercy because you have not learned how to receive my mercy. See, when you're humbled by the love of God, and you're humbled by the mercy of God, when you know what a stinking rat you are and that God loves you anyway, when you know that you know better, but one more time now, you've messed up and need God's help. See, that love will melt a hard heart. And God wants us to receive that from Him so that can pour through us to other people. Because to many of the people that you're around right now, you may be the only Jesus that they'll see. They're not looking for a relationship with God. Maybe they've tried some brand of religion and found that it was empty, or they even went and got hurt, or they tried it and didn't feel like, maybe they tried to read the Bible, didn't feel like they could understand it. So maybe they believe that God exists somewhere, but it's not a personal thing with them, and they need help. They're desperate, and they need somebody to show them the love of God 
and God wants to use you. But you don't have anything to give them if you don't first go to your heavenly Father and get completely filled up. What do you think I'd have to give you if I hadn't learned how to receive from God? I minister to you out of the overflow of my life. John 10, 10 says, I want, I came that you might have joy abundantly to the full, till it overflows. God doesn't want us just to have barely enough to get by every day and just exist. He wants us to have an overflow in our life. And you've got to take some time to receive. God, I didn't do very good this week. I just, <laughs> I ask you to forgive me, God. You know, the devil's trying to make me afraid now that you're not going to help me in this situation I'm in because I wasn't good, but I know he's a liar. So I just ask you for mercy. And God, would you just help me anyway? <laughs> I know I don't deserve it, God, but would you just help me anyway? Thank you, God, for loving me unconditionally. Thank you that you'll never leave me nor forsake me. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your love. I receive your mercy. I receive favor today, God. Everywhere I go, I pray that I'm going to get favor. Special circumstances, even though I don't deserve it. Thank you, God, for loving me. This is what people need. They don't need to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ and be given a list of 25 things now they have to do to be accepted by everybody. They need to know love, 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 love. Then what happens? Now all of a sudden, they're, they're healed inside. They're whole. They're secure. They've got confidence. Now they say, what can I do for you, God? But they're not doing it because they think they have to to keep God from beating over the head, beating them over the head with a hammer. God, you know, I remember when God said to me one day, I don't want you doing anything for me anymore if you don't want to. <laughs> don't you go get in that room and read four chapters in that Bible because you think it's going to get you some brownie points with me. <laughs> if you don't want to read it, don't read it. You're not reading it. When you read your Bible, you're not reading it for God. You're the one that needs to read it. He knows it. <laughs> Why would any sane person not want to pray? It's not some obligation. My goodness, he said, when you pray, tremendous power is made available to you. Ask in my name and you shall receive everything that you need to meet your needs. My goodness, I pray because I don't think I could get through a day without it. You know, this, for some of you, it may just be a little subtle shift in how you see your relationship with God. But not, not, listen, he doesn't want you to do anything good to get him to love you. God is not for sale. You cannot buy God with good works. Jesus paid. <laughs> God is not for sale. So I can't buy him by reading the Bible through every year. I can't buy him by memorizing Psalms and Proverbs. I can't buy him by taking widows to lunch or feeding the poor. I can't buy him by getting up at five o'clock in the morning and trying to pray for three hours every morning. God's not for sale. But what I can do is I can do all of those things because I am so <laughs> totally blown away <laughs> by his love and His mercy, and His forgiveness, and His grace, and His goodness. Well, God is a giver, and He wants to give to you, but you need to be willing to receive. We need to learn how to receive from God. We need to not receive what the devil wants to tell us, but always be open to what God wants to do in our life. You know, if we learn how to receive, then God can do all that He wants to do in our lives and He can use us for His glory.
je kindertijd. Een tijd om te dansen in de zon en te zingen in de regen. Een tijd om uitbundig te lachen en onbekommerd op avontuur te gaan. En om je vervelende broertje te plagen. Kind zijn betekent leren, groeien, geloven en dromen. Maar ook nu zijn er op de wereld heel veel kinderen die geen idee hebben van hoe je kindertijd zou moeten zijn. Ze zijn alleen bezig met overleven. Deze kleintjes moeten s'nachts vaak slapen zonder een dak boven hun hoofd. Ze hebben dorst, lijden honger en voelen zich eenzaam. Sommigen van hen hebben zichzelf die dag meermalen moeten verkopen... voordat ze hun misbruikte lichaam te rusten kunnen leggen. Helaas is dit niet een verhaaltje over een handvol kinderen in een onzichtbare wereld. Nee, het is een keiharde werkelijkheid. Hier en nu, voor echte kinderen, onze kinderen... Sommigen leven bij jou om de hoek. Anderen hier vele duizenden kilometers vandaan. Maakt die afstand dat een kind minder behoefte heeft aan liefde, bescherming en verzorging? Maken geslacht, ras of omstandigheden dat een kind minder deel uitmaakt van onze menselijke familie? Nee, toch? Een mens is een mens. Een nood is een nood. En een kind is een kind. Zo kostbaar in Gods ogen. In welke uithoek van de wereld een kind ook om hulp roept... wij moeten er gehoor aan geven. Op welke grond de tranen van een kind ook vallen... wij gaan erheen. We have traveled long. die ons hun steun waard vinden, zijn wij in staat om vele hulpbehoevende kinderhanden vast te pakken. Maar er zijn nog veel meer kinderen op de wereld die schreeuwen om hulp. Geeft u daar gehoor aan? Ze zijn op zoek naar een helpende hand. Helpt u ons mee om ze die te bieden? Vind je het moeilijk om te bidden? Te ingewikkeld? Bidden kan zoiets moois zijn. Praat met God eenvoudig over alles. 
Een boek van Joyce Meyer kan jou hierbij helpen. De kracht van een eenvoudig gebed. Leer hoe je met God over alles kunt praten. Je kunt het boek De kracht van een eenvoudig gebed nu bestellen via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of telefonisch op 026 20 22 100. De computerdeskundigen van Joyce Meyer Ministries werken keihard aan onze Nederlandse website. Hey, does anybody need any more coffee? Be right back. Ga naar onze nieuwe site joyce-meyer.nl en volg ons op Facebook.